this may very well be the most instructive game of chess ever played, and I'm not exaggerating when I say that. Capablanca's play in this game is so clear and easy to understand that it really changed chess moving forward. After this game, everybody wanted to emulate Capablanca's style. It was really, really an amazing achievement. This was played in a match against Frank Marshall. And there had been nine straight draws before this game, even though Capablanca only needed one win. And this is the 23rd game of that match. Marshall has white. Capablanca has black. Let us jump right in. Marshall begins with d4, d5, c4, e6, knight, c3. And here a surprise from Capablanca. He plays uh, c5. He had been playing knight to f6. And uh, this uh, Lasker variation where black seeks to trade off pieces. And that's more in the style that we've come to know uh, for Capablanca. The, the interesting thing about this Tarash defense is that Black willingly takes on a pawn weakness, which we usually do not associate with uh, Capablanca. CD5, ED5, Knight F3, Knight C6, and it's this pawn on D5 that can become a potential weakness in Black's uh, position. So Marshall targets that pawn directly by playing G3. He wants to move the bishop to G2, aim it right at uh, that D5 pawn, the main line here these days is knight to f6, bishop g2, bishop to e7. Not developing this queen's bishop just yet, because that bishop might want to go to g4, where it's more aggressively posted. Um, but Capablanca just plays bishop to e6, overprotecting that uh, vulnerable d5 pawn right out of the gate. Bishop g2, again aiming at that d5 pawn. Bishop e7, castles, knight to f6. And here Frank Marshall plays the move bishop to g5, but this isn't as quite as strong in this position. The idea is to trade off a defender of, uh, of the d5 pawn, um, but since the d5 pawn is protected by the bishop at e6, it's not quite as strong. A more accurate move is probably dc5, bishop takes knight to a4, and uh, the idea is that the rook comes to c1 and, and white is playing for control of the c5 square. Uh, after bishop g5, Capablanca plays this really nice move, knight to e4, the same kind of move he was playing in the Lasker <laughs> variation, and it really accomplishes the same thing. It trades off pieces and frees up Black's position so that his uh, pieces gain mobility. The bishop takes at e7, queen takes e7. Now, we know Marshall, the inventor of the Marshall attack and the Marshall gambit, an aggressive player. Um, and here, a calm move like rook to c1 was probably best, and you have a playable game for both sides. Uh, but he plays a much more aggressive move, which was his style. He plays knight to e5, uh, mixing things up in the center of the board, obviously uh, threatening to capture the knight on e4. Uh, but he's sacrificing a pawn, and Capablanca takes that pawn, and he takes it in the best way possible. Knight takes d4, capturing that, that pawn. Knight takes e4 from Marshall. DE4, and uh, Capablanca actually has a, a threat here. If bishop takes pawn, then black can play bishop h3 with a double attack, hitting the rook at f1 and also the knight at e5. So Marshall has to, he can't grab that pawn at e4. So he plays e3, hitting the knight first. Um, now, in this position, knight to f3 check was played by Capablanca. He gives the pawn back, but creates some weaknesses, uh, tries to take advantage of these weaker light squares in uh, Marshall's position. Um, in the game he took with the knight, it, taking with the bishop actually might have been a little better. Um, EF3, queen to a4 check, and the best move for black uh, is king to f8 here. Black is a little bit better after king to f8. Uh, if instead Capablanca had played the bishop to d7, then after knight takes, queen takes, and queen to e4 check, he gets back that f3 pawn, and uh, white has a, maybe a slight advantage. Not much, but uh, the, he, there's a tempo up in the fight for the d file, basically. Uh, after knight f3, which is played by Marshall, pawn takes, queen takes f3. Now we have an important moment to assess the imbalances in this position. This is the moment where the real genius of Capablanca kicks in, and the clarity of his strategy is revealed. Uh, what we have here is a position with mutual pawn majorities, right? Black has three pawns versus two on the queen side. White has four pawns versus three on the king side. And what both sides want to do is advance their pawns forward and create a passed pawn and threaten to queen it and use that as an advantage. 
Uh, the issue is that black, because he has a queenside pawn majority, can advance that pawn structure very easily. Whereas white's pawn majority, if he advances it, it exposes his king at g1, making it much harder to, uh, to do that for white. And Capablanca's advance of the pawn majority in this game was so brilliant that after this game, it was considered a clear advantage. If you had a queenside pawn majority, you had an advantage in chess. Uh, it wasn't until Alekin came along and showed that that was only one factor of many, and he showed that how the dynamic potential of uh, the position without the queenside pawn majority, that changed everything. But uh, this game, Capablanca handles this majority with absolute perfection. First, he castles. Um, White plays rook f to c1. He, yes, he can grab the b7 pawn. It actually might have been the best move. Um, I think he was worried, of course, after uh, rook to b8, queens come off. And this idea of Capablanca having a rook on the seventh is just very, uh, very unsettling, I think, for anyone. As it turns out, after attacking the c-pawn, uh, White can very possibly hold this position, and maybe it was even the best option in the game. But he didn't want that rook on the seventh. So he plays rook f to c1, immediately applying pressure to black c5-pawn. Rook a to b8. We see Capablanca not only defending the b7-pawn, but preparing to advance it. He's going to advance his pawn majority as quickly as he can. Queen to e4. Marshall is threatening bishop to h3, trying to take advantage of this pinned, bis pinned bishop at e6. It wouldn't win material, but it would create an isolated pawn on e6. That's what he's trying to do. So Capablanca sidesteps that with queen to c7. Rook to c3, perhaps wanting to build up pressure against c5. And now, boom, b5. Capablanca, very simply advancing his queenside pawn majority. Uh, the best way to slow that down is probably b3. Marshall plays a3. And uh, Capablanca's next move, again, very instructive, c4. Now, it's important to note that in these positions with these competing pawn majorities, control of the d-file is massively important. In fact, controlling the d-file is probably more important than advancing the majority. It's huge. And you can see that this rook on c3 is poorly placed to contest the d-file. That's sort of the, one of the strengths behind this move from Capablanca. And Kasparov called this a micro-nuance, you know, something that's very, very, very tiny. But what Capablanca knew is if you do a lot of really, really small things, eventually they become a big thing. What starts off as micro becomes macro. And this is one of more, a few micro-nuances in this game, limiting the mobility of that rook. Um, rook to d1 is probably white's best move challenging that file as quickly as possible, and if black challenges it, you just bring that rook back. That was probably his best, best uh, move. Instead, Marshall plays bishop to f3, trying to control the, the d1 square with the bishop. Rook f to d8, rook d1, rook takes, bishop takes, rook to d8. And now Capablanca has established control over the d file, and this rook at c3 is still very poorly placed, not in a position to contend. Uh, with that, that rook. Very strong from Capablanca. Uh, the bishop goes to f3. It was attacked undefended on d1. And here Capablanca plays g6. It gives his king room, adds to contr the control of f5. Now, some of you that have some strategic chess training will recognize that uh, white, oh, excuse me, black is putting all of his pawns on light squares. And what we're taught is that, certainly in an endgame, uh, you want your pawns on the opposite color of your bishop, if both sides have the same color bishop, as they do here. Um, but what Capablanca understands is that th that subtlety doesn't matter here. All that really matters is control this, of this d-file and advancing the pawn majority. And the move g6 stabilizes his position to do exactly that. So the issue with pawns on light squares is not a big deal here. And he's also threatening, by the way, bishop uh, to d5, which would win win a piece because the queen would have to go to g4 and then uh, h5 and the bishop would be would be lost. So he, instead he plays the queen to c6, hoping to exchange queens. And black could do this. He could exchange queens, but after bishop takes, it's attacking b5 and the black can defend and it's okay. So here comes a second micro nuance. Instead of exchanging queens on c6, Capablanca plays the queen to e5 and threatening to come in with rook to d2 and cause all kinds of havoc. Marshall brings the queen back, and now Capablanca exchanges queens. Bishop takes queen, and the bishop's just not in as good a position. It's not putting pressure on b5, as it were, it was in that other line. 
It's these little accumulations of small things beginning to add up in a big way. Um, here, Capablanca, rook to d2 would actually be an inaccuracy here. It looks strong, but rook to c2 and, and white is fighting back, um, contesting the position. Uh, what white wants to do is play the king over as quickly as possible and uh, just try to save the position that way. So what Capablanca does is first he delivers a check, forcing the king up to g2, and now a5, beginning to advance those pawns, and black's pawns are very fast here. The rook goes to c2, b4, continuing to advance the pawn, pawn takes, pawn takes, now bishop to f3, uh, hitting the rook, but mainly wanting to position this bishop at e2 to put pressure on the c4 pawn to help slow that down. The rook goes to b1, behind the b2 pawn. Now, uh, bishop to e2, if he plays rook to d2, we get position similar to that in the game. Um, so bishop to e2. So is Marshall now going to win that pawn and be okay? Well, Capablanca plays the move b3, taking advantage of the limited mobility of this rook at c2. It only has really two squares it can go to. If it goes to c3, then just rook takes b2, threatening the bishop, and after bishop takes c4, then rook to c2. And that wins a piece after rook takes b3, rook takes bishop. So the rook instead goes to d2. Now rook to c1, threatening rook to c2. And if the rooks are traded, the pawn will advance. So bishop to d1 from Marshall to keep the rook out of the c2 square. But now Capablanca has a breakthrough with that pawn majority. c3, forcing the exchange of pawns because obviously the rook is attacked. Pawn takes, and now b2. Threatening to queen, if white plays bishop to c2 to slow down that pawn, then just rook takes bishop. After rook takes rook, obviously, you would promote to a queen and win. So that forces Marshall to take the pawn on b2, and then rook takes bishop. Now, white does have two pawns for the bishop. Well, let's see if Capablanca can convert this advantage. First, Marshall plays rook to c2. We know you're supposed to put your rooks behind your pawns, your past pawns. But watch how Capablanca replaces Marshall's rook behind the pawn with his own rook behind the pawn. First, he plays bishop to f5, kicks that rook away, and then boom. He says, no, I want my rook behind the pawn. So his rook is there. Rook to b3, bishop to e4, check. He can't play f3 because of rook to c2, check. And when the king moves, he would lose that f3 pawn. So instead, he has to play the king to h3. Rook to c2 attacking the pawn at f2. The only way to defend it is f4. That was played by Marshall. And now h5. What Capablanca wants to do is play bishop to f5 check, followed by rook takes h2. So Marshall plays g4 first. Pawn takes king g4. But now rook takes h2. And now white is only up one pawn. And his king is beginning to get very low on available squares. It doesn't have much mobility here. The rook goes to b4 to attack black's bishop, but now f5 check is played. The king can't go to g5 because of king to g7, and the threat is rook to h5 mate, and there's nothing white can do about it. The only check he has, rook to b7, and the bishop would just take the rook, and then the mate would come. So he has to play the king back to g3. It's that rook. That rook goes to e3, excuse me, e2, attacking e3, and there's really nothing white can do to defend the pawn. Rook to c4, rook to e3, check to h4, now king to g7, and we see mating nets beginning to form. Rook to c7, check, king to f6, and again, white can't check on c6 because the bishop at e4 controls the square. Rook to d7, and now bishop to g2. The threat is rook to h3, check, mate. So rook to d6, check, to push that king away. King to g7, rook to d7, check, and king to h6, and uh, White resigned. Actually, he resigned, I should say, in this position. Uh, and the reason he resigned is because of this move, king to h6. And rook to h3 mate is inevitable. Even if black, excuse me, white gives up the rook, now there's nothing to be done. And mate will take place. So the clarity of that position, advancing that majority, those little micro nuances, limiting the mobility of Marshall's pieces, controlling that defile, an astonishing, astonishing achievement. Thank you for joining us at Chess Dog. See you again soon.